Um, <laughs> all right. So the number one pick, we don't really need to discuss it, right? It's Caleb. No, there's no if ands, or buts yeah. about it. Okay. So yep, we're good there. Okay. So the ninth pick, I've argued take a blue chip offensive player at receiver or tackle. If somehow one of those is not available, then trade down. I saw you making the argument of trading down at nine. Is that regardless of who's available or are there exceptions to your philosophy of what Ryan Poles should do with that second first round pick? It very much depends on who's there, Danny. And I, I think a lot of it, you know, that was after the Buffalo trade this morning of the five digs. Everyone's saying Buffalo's got to go up. Buffalo's got to go up. And, and I agree with that. I think Chicago is a spot that makes sense to call because you want to get ahead of the New York Jets. You know, you want to get ahead of, you know, the, the, the Raiders. You want to get ahead of the Saints. You want to, you know, those teams that could potentially take a receiver. You're doing that, you know, if you're the, the Bills to try to get a Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors, which conversely – would be the two players that the Chicago Bears would most likely want to draft in that spot. So I think I just think Chicago is a natural trade back, you know, spot at nine because of the fact that they don't have a second round pick and they don't have selections in rounds five, six, and seven. Now, something that I find very, very fascinating is that I've been doing this since 2011. This is the shallowest draft pool during that time, and I've been told by people who've been doing this longer than me. This is the shallowest draft pool in a long, long time because of record low number of underclassmen entering the draft. The 2020 COVID year, think about how many guys went back to college for an extra year because 2020 didn't count. Because of that, we have this incredibly shallow draft pool where norm, in a normal year, guys, I'm trying to cut my list to get to like 500, 600 players. This year, I'm sitting at 430 players, and I'm, like, scrounging to try to find more just in case they get drafted. So the fact that Poles has played this so well, no, you don't have picks on day three, really. This isn't a good year to have picks on day three. So hmm. all that to say, the Bears could trade back at nine, absolutely. But I don't think you're, like, you know, completely damned if you don't have a sixth-round draft pick this year because that player, in a normal year, is an undrafted free agent. And I think I think neighbors and Odunze, sorry, Speaks, w- would be guys that they would draft instead of trade out of. I would certainly would, and I, I yeah, I mean, I think that's an easy decision if they're on the board, do it. But also, you know, the thing is, now everyone knows that Buffalo needs a receiver, so you at least have to answer the phone and be like, because they could be offering a, a ton of, of draft capital to go from twenty eight to nine. That's the Julio Jones trade. You're talking multiple first-round picks to do that. So I think you at least have to listen to that offer if it comes in, and you make that decision on the clock. You know, if something gets crazy and, you know, you're sitting at Brian Thomas Jr., and you're like, oh, this is a little early for Brian Thomas Jr., we'll be willing to, to trade back from this spot. Then I then I think you can uh, can entertain that. But, you know, I, I love everything they've done, you know, so far in this offseason. I still look at wide receiver. I still look at defensive tackle as – the areas where you would like to see them add some some players outside of quarterback in this draft. All right, Matt. So who are a couple of wide receivers who are not that big three of neighbors, Adunze and Harrison, who could be a future like big bodied X receiver, number one for the Bears? Because Keenan Allen, probably only here for a year, needs someone who's young to grow with Caleb Williams. Who are a couple guys beyond the big three that you like? And I have 20 wide receivers graded in my top three rounds, so we could this could be a long segment. Uh, outside of those guys, I mentioned Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU, led the nation with 17 touchdown catches last year, 4-3-3 speed, he's six foot three, 205 pounds. Adonai Mitchell from Texas, almost a carbon copy, six, almost 6'3", six, 204, 4-3-4 speed. Those are the two guys in the first round that would fit that mold. In the second round, you're looking at Xavier Leggett, South Carolina, Keon Coleman, Florida State, Ricky Pearsall from Florida, uh, Devontae Walker from North Carolina, Jalen Polk from Washington. Like There are a lot of guys in this draft that fit that X receiver mold. Hell, even Brendan Rice in the third round, Jerry's boy, is six foot two, 200 pounds, a really good route runner. No, he doesn't have that electric 4-3 speed, but he's 4-5 speed and a really good breaking route runner. So there are plenty of players in this class that fit that mold. So what do you think the likelihood is? We're talking to Matt Miller from ESPN at NFL Draft Scout on Twitter. What do you think the likelihood is 
that four quarterbacks, three receivers, and Joe Walt are the first eight picks. I feel great about that. I think that's what will happen. And it will probably be a team like the Minnesota Vikings trading up to grab that fourth quarterback, maybe the Denver Broncos. But someone trades up to get, whether it be McCarthy or May, and then the three receivers. And, yeah, Joel, I think that's what it is. We might be looking at a top ten that doesn't have a defensive player, unless the Falcons at eight could take Dallas Turner, the pass rusher from Alabama, or Jared Burris from Florida State. But it's, it's going to be a very top-heavy group of wide receivers, the tackle, and four quarterbacks. So in that world, I think that's where Ryan Poles' decision gets very difficult. If he has the ninth pick in an eight offensive player draft and he's taking his quarterback, would you, you know, I, I know you said trade down, maybe the trade down offer comes, maybe it doesn't. Let's for this hypothetical say it doesn't come. Is the is Dallas Turner, Byron Murphy, the second offensive tackle or the fourth wide receiver, the person that would have the highest grade if they went best player available on Matt Miller's board? It'd be Dallas Turner and then Byron Murphy right behind him. Okay. And I think based on this roster, it would be Byron Murphy just because we saw last year, you know, they threw assets in the third round, second and third round at defensive tackle. Maybe they still believe in Zach Pickens and Gervon Dexter, and they say, we're, we're good. We want to see these guys develop. Let's not throw more assets at it. But Byron Murphy would be very, very exciting in this defense. You know, it's a, you know, just somebody that can wreck things in the middle, be a penetrator at the three technique. I would I would think that would be more valuable than as much as I like Dallas Turner. I, I would think a three technique in this defense would be a little more valuable. We've been waiting for Matt Eberflus to have his Brenson Buckner, right? Uh, it, it, wait, waiting for him to have his his guy there in, in in the middle, and maybe it is Dexter, or maybe he goes Wilkins. If they decide to go D end, you said Turner. Uh, where are you on Jared Verse from Florida State? I'm wondering which of those they would like as a better fit for D-end opposite Montez Sweat. I love Jared Verse. Uh, so I have Dallas Turner ranked as my number seven overall player. I have Jared Verse as my number 14 overall player. So they're very different. You know, Dallas is 245 pounds. He's long. He's twitchy. Jared Verse is a lot like Trey Hendrickson. You know, he is a true 4-3 defensive end, 6-4, 255, strong hands, you know, really, really good um, – upper body movement. I, I think he's able to, with grip strength, control guys. He plays with leverage. So they're both good players. I think the speed of Dallas Turner, like, I mean, that dude ran a 4-4-8, four, four, uh, four, four, excuse me. I mean, he, he looks like a corner when he starts his 40-yard dash. I would think the speed of that opposite sweat would be really, really tough to pass on if, if you go into it with a mindset of, all right, the receivers are gone, let's go defense and try to turn this into something really special up front. Turner would be hard to say no to if you're debating the two defensive ends. Let's go back to the tackles for a minute. In the scenario where Alt is gone, who is the second tackle to you? Is it Fatano? Is it Olu? Who, who is it for you? It would be Olu. Uh, I basically have he and Fulaga tied at tackle. You know, one's the left, one's the right. Uh, Darnell Wright played really, really well last year. You're set on the right side of the line. So Olu would be in the consideration there. Guys, I don't know how the Chicago land feels about this. I like Braxton Jones. I really like Braxton Jones knowing that he makes $750,000 a year. For his play at that value is incredible to me. And I know he missed some time last year, but I, I'm of the mindset of I don't think he's like replacement level bad. I don't see him of like, God, we got, you got to get that guy out of there. I, I would be interested to see, you know, how he continues to develop. Um, I know that rookie year, you know, he was attributed with a ton of sacks. I think that colored some of the perception to him, but I thought he looked really good last year when he was out there. Yeah, we agree that he's good but not great. They used a first-round pick on Darnell Wright. Poles is an offensive lineman. He drafted Braxton Jones. I don't think he would take the second tackle over him, but I do think he would take Joe Walt. And I would, too. I, yeah, okay. if, it, if, if that's the conversation, because I don't know that Joe Alt is ever going to be Trent Williams, but I think he could be really, really good for a long time, and he could be good right away. I think – that's another thing to remember. Rarely do offensive tackles come in and you see it year one where you're like, oh, goodness, that's look at that. That's nice. You know, it's usually it's a slow build with those guys. Year one, you see some flashes and then things solidify because, you know, experience is so important at that position. So uh, I would, you know, look at it that way of, you know, this is kind of the, you know, nut cutting time for Braxton Jones, as we like to say in Southern Missouri. 
Uh, this is the year where he's kind of got to show out, and if not, you're looking at tackle next year. I always feel bad for the bull because that's what we're talking about. Nut cutting time is like it's castration thirty, right? Yeah, it's it, it is. Yeah, it yep, doesn't, that doesn't. Is. I wasn't going to be that graphic. But well, yeah, that is what it is. Well, it's ham radio, baby. We can do what we want. Um, <laughs> uh, Matt, you got me excited again about the idea of trading down. Uh, I mean, I liked that from the get go for nine once they signed Keenan Allen. But, you know, we've talked so much about it and over-talked it because the value you get there, like the Diggs pick, the pick that, that Buffalo just got from is, is the second rounder that belongs to the Vikings from Houston. So if the Vikings are bad in a really good division with a rookie quarterback or with Sam Darnold, depending on how they do it, that could be like a high too. So I don't know if you'd... I don't know if you'd get that one, but they they probably would be willing to give you a bunch to go from 28 to 9. Have you thought about the value of that overall package a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I look at it as like going back in time to think about, you know, the original Julio Jones trade. And, and that's, I mean, it's multiple first-round picks. So it's to come up that far, to go from 28 to they went to 4, but, you know, to to go up that high – that's where I think you get excited about. You could be looking at, you know, a first rounder that should be 28, a first rounder next year. And I, I think even Buffalo has, you know, kind of shielded themselves from this because now they have two second round picks next year. And like you say, you're, you're thinking in your head that, okay, that Vikings pick is probably going to be an earlier one is, is probably where you're at mentally. So, um, you know, that's, that's where you would get excited about as well as this team has drafted, um, to where you can say, okay, like, gosh, now we're loaded. And we're, you know, you're resetting the clock at quarterback, too. So you're loaded where, man, you can still be aggressive in free agency. So, you know, that original pick was a first, second, fourth round pick to Cleveland. Uh, so it was it was big. And that was still from 27 to 6, excuse me, not to 4. So it's it was a lot back in the day. And I think now, you know, trades are even more expensive now than they've ever been to move up because teams know what they have at the top of the draft thanks to the – the rookie wage scale, you know, it's it's much cheaper nowadays to go up there and get that. All right, I just want to do a couple of things that will uh, not likely be things that face the Bears but are going to face teams drafting in front of the Bears. Uh, what are the chances that Malik Neighbors is drafted before Marvin Harrison Jr.? It, there's a chance, but I think it's slimmer than, than has been reported. You know, I Danny, we were at the Senior Bowl, and I was one of the – People who said, hey, I've talked to a handful of teams. They like Malik Nambers more than Marvin Harrison Jr. What really matters is do the Arizona Cardinals like Harrison Jr. more than Malik Nambers? And then after that, you know, do the Chargers and do the Giants? I think those are the three teams that, that actually will have to make that decision. Uh, I, I still think it's Harrison Jr. over Nambers. But there is a lot of love out there for Malik given the year that he just had. What are the chances that J.J. McCarthy gets taken before Drake May? Pretty good. I mean, it, I would say it's 50-50, honestly. Um, I don't care. You know, I was just, you know, yeah, a lot of it is I, – I always go back to this, man. So much of quarterback evaluation happens off the field. It happens from January till now right. because it's so much about personality and, you know, work ethic and, you know, that mental ability. And I, I do think not, not a knock in any way to Drake May. But that is where J.J. McCarthy's winning people over, at least. I wonder, like, the last time that the quarterback who skyrockets up the board between January and May ended up being worth it. Have you done the research on that? Thinking about Zach Wilson, thinking about Mitch Trubisky. Josh Allen. Yeah, well, Josh Allen's one. So, yeah, are there as many hits as there are misses in that regard, Matt? Uh, More misses. I mean, Baker was that guy. You know, Baker Mayfield started the process. Is like, he might be like, QB four or five in that draft, and he was the first pick overall. So um, it's not it's not great. Josh Allen was, you know, I was a Josh Allen guy from way back in the day. I thought the Bears would have drafted him, you know, the, the year prior to that had he come out. So um, I do think that more often than not, these late risers, you, you get a little afraid of them. Paxton Lynch was a late riser. Um, but, you know, I think it's different depending on where J.J. goes. If he goes to Minnesota – they have a really good structure in place for whichever quarterback ends up in Minnesota is in a really good spot, basically. Is uh, is Sean Payton just going to hang tight at 12 and wait for Bo Nix and shock the world there? I don't know what the hell Sean's doing. Uh, that is a great question. I mean, I- I've had this rant before. It's well rehearsed. Every team in the NFL feels like added a quarterback. And, like every team, you know, Drew Locke goes here, Sam Howell goes there. You know, it's like everybody's playing this game of like moving chairs. 
the Broncos did nothing. They have Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci. So they have to draft a quarterback. I just wonder if Peyton is, and he's deserved the right to be confident. I wonder if he's almost too confident and says, uh-huh. give me Spencer Rattler in the third round. I'll make this work just to kind of prove people wrong to some degree. Um, but yeah, Bo Nix at 12 is a very popular pick in mock drafts because of the fact that the Broncos just don't have any answers to that position. He's got like some Tony La Russa in him. Like I'm just, look how smart I am. Look how smart I am. And he's got the pelts on the wall. To yeah, live he's by also it. very, very good at it though. Yeah, so far. Uh, he is. He is. All right, two quick things, then we'll, uh, we'll let you out of here. So what would be the like, best-case scenario for the Packers and best-case scenario for the Lions, which would be worst-case scenario for the Bears? It's tough to mock them, but Packers are picking 25th, Lions are picking 29th. What are those guys rooting for? Packers are rooting for some offensive linemen to slip through the cracks, I think. I, a lot of been said about corner and safety. They need those. But I think offensive tackle, you know, they have to – and that guy might play guard for a year, but they have to start thinking about the offensive line. I think for the Lions, it's either defensive line spot, D end or D tackle. You're hoping again that, that someone slips through the crack. You know, maybe it's Chop Robinson, maybe it's Darius Robinson. Like they're they're kind of hoping that one of those fringe first round guys makes it to them. Okay, Matt Miller, great stuff. Uh, I don't know if you'll be bringing Tank Seven to Detroit, but whatever it is, man, uh, I'll be to- toasting to you while we watch you on national TV. Congrats on all your success, buddy. Appreciate you guys. Always good to talk to you. All right. Thanks, That's Matt. Matt Miller. Pole's position is brought to you by Black Diamond Plumbing and Mechanical. There when you need us. Decided not to lead him into my guys, Adonai Mitchell and Keon Coleman, and just see where he would go. Yeah. And he mentioned them in a pretty big mix of wide receivers who might be able to develop into the X, because I'm convinced that's that's where they're going to go in terms of what Shane Waldron needs, and and they they need one. They need a young one. I am not interested in that idea of a trade all the way down to 28 with Buffalo. You'd get a second round pick this year and you'd get a first round pick next year, but from Buffalo. So next year's first round pick from Buffalo, assuming they're good again, you know, and maybe I know a lot of people think they'll take a step back, but what are they going to be? Best case scenario, that's the 16th pick in the draft, 18th pick in the draft. So, so you know what I mean? Somewhere in there. They're not, they're not winning. They're not winning six games next year. If that's a wide receiver, at 28, and it's n- not somebody who desperately needs to be a producer for you in year one because you've got Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. But you don't know who it is when you make the trade. I know, well, maybe they maybe they love a couple of them. You know, maybe they love Adonai Mitchell and Keon Coleman, and they know Brian Thomas is going to go first, and they think Xavier Leggett's going to go first. And even if Mitchell's gone, they can get Keon down there. Like if they if they love somebody who they know is going to be there, and they don't feel like the drop off from Rome. Is is that massive? I I won't be I won't be upset about it because you'll need those other picks. It depends on who they end up getting with that twenty eight. I'm only okay with the trade down if it goes top eight offensive players one through eight, and you see no difference between Latu and Turner and Murphy and you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. In that scenario, I'd be okay with it. But if they trade out of Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors. It would uh, it would really really bum me out. I don't think that they'll do it. It's not gonna it's not gonna overshadow my Caleb Williams love, but it would be it would it would bum me Caleb out. Caleb would still be coming in with DeAndre Swift, Komet and Everett, DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, I know. and a rookie th- and a rookie wide receiver of some kind. Maybe it's his buddy Brendan Rice. Maybe what? they don't take a wide receiver until round. 